بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين ما بعد. I apologize about the delay. We're having some technical issues about broadcasting uh, it live. So right now we're just on audio for our online uh, interview, uh, uh, online uh, uh, guests. But for us in the audience, obviously here, inshallah, obviously it's live for us over here. So uh, inshallah, we're going to have a short uh, talk about the blessings of Umrah and just very briefly go over uh, the uh, fiqh of it and then open the floor for Q&A. And I hope that inshallah you've already seen the video uh, that I already sent out on our list. Uh, and the main purpose of today is really the Q&A. Uh, and inshallah later on we'll have a little bit of logistics as well. So right now it's not really about the logistics, it's about uh, the procedure of performing uh, Umrah and for to get us into the spirit of performing Umrah. And the fact of the matter is that many of us, uh, we... we kind of take Umrah as something not as big or as, as a trivial act of worship. But the fact of the matter is that Umrah is one of the most important and one of the most blessed acts that uh, Muslims can do. And in fact, it is really second only to the Hajj itself. And that is why the Umrah is actually called the minor Hajj. In fact, you can call the Umrah Al-Hajj Al-Azghar. You can even call it. It is the smaller Hajj. Because you do most of the rites of Hajj and you... Uh, show respect to the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we should go with that niyyah when we go for Umrah that we are undertaking one of the greatest actions of worship that a Muslim can do because we are venerating the house that Allah has called his own house. And this place that we are going to is of course a place that Allah declared sacred before any other land. This was the first land that Allah declared sacred and it was the land that of course upon the tongue of the Prophet Ibrahim alayhi salam it was declared to be the very first house of worship and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in the Quran that the land of Mecca or the valley of Bakka has been declared sacred and it is the most blessed uh, place in the entire world and therefore Allah says that whoever uh, intends uh, to do any type of evil in this land, Allah will give him the most severe punishment. وَمَنْ يُرِدْ فِيهِ بِالْحَدْ Simply wanting to do evil in Makkah. Our scholars say, if Allah says wanting to do evil in Makkah will get you a sin, then wanting to do good in Makkah will also get you much more reward. Simply wanting to do good. So when we go for Makkah, our niyyah should be that we will do as much ibadah as possible, that we will uh, give to the fuqara, that we will pray, that we will do tawaf, and that we will of course do umrah, and that the mere intent Intention of doing these good deeds, it will it will magnify uh, the blessings of these good deeds. And our Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam praised going for Umrah in so many a hadith. We don't have time to go into all of them, and many of them are mentioned in uh, the lecture that I sent you. But just to get us into the spirit of going for Umrah, that our Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said that Hajj and Umrah, al Hajj wal Umrah, the both of them, they get rid of your sins and your poverty. Two things are gotten rid of. Just like a furnace gets rid of the impurities in iron. So when you throw the uh, raw ore into the furnace, what comes out is the pure metal. So our Prophet is describing Hajj al-Umrah as that furnace that gets rid of two things. What are the two things that fall? Number one, our sins fall off. So just like when we go for Hajj, we expect to come back a fully clean person. Similarly, we should have the same intention when we go for Umrah. Know that Umrah is not as blessed as Hajj. But nonetheless, it is right under it. It is the Hajj Azghar. So when we go for Umrah, our niyyah should be as well that we come back as a clean person, as a pure person. And also, we, we uh, intend, and there's nothing wrong to intend this, that, oh Allah, I'm spending so much of my money and my time for your sake. And your Prophet has promised that when I go and spend money, for Umrah, that Allah will re- eliminate faqr or poverty from me. So we want to be eliminated from the poverties uh, that all of us uh, obviously want to avoid. And our Prophet wasallam said that one Umrah to the next Umrah will forgive all of the sins between them as long as the major sins are avoided. So, Al-Umrah to ila al-Umrati kafaratun liba baynahuma. That one Umrah to the next Umrah, it will be as if it's a cleansing experience for all of the sins as long as the major sins were avoided. Of course, the major sins are like zina and murder and qatil. These are the major sins. If we avoid these major sins, then the umrah acts as a cleansing factor. That from one umrah to the next. So this is an encouragement. We should go for umrah frequently. And unfortunately, many of us are a little bit lackadaisical when it comes to umrah. We're like, no big deal, you know. Uh, inshallah, once every decade or so. But our Prophet is saying what? That the more umrahs you do, the more you will be clean. 
So one Umrah to the next Umrah. So we should already be thinking, when is the next time I'm going to go for Umrah? It should already be in our mind. Maybe not next year, two, three years from now, it's my niyyah to go for Umrah if Allah has given me the wealth to do so. And our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that Hajj and Umrah is one of the two types of jihad. Ahadul jihadain. Of course, the other jihad is the actual ghazwa. So he called Hajj and Umrah, he said that, إِنَّهَا أَحَدُ jihadain. It is one of the two jihads. And this shows us that uh, the greatest physical journey that we can do after the ghazwa of a legitimate nature, the second greatest physical journey will be the journey for Hajj and uh, Umrah. And our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that raising the voice, now here's another point by the way, a lot of us think that labbaik Allahumma labbaik is only for the Hajj. And this is a big misconception. In fact, the talbiyah, labbaik Allahumma labbaik, is for the state of ihram. So whenever you're in ihram, you say the talbiyah. And therefore the Umrah also has the talbiyah in it. It's not just for the Hajj. And all of the blessings of the Talbiyah that we mentioned uh, before we go for Hajj, we talk about them, they apply for the Umrah as well. Because the Umrah is also an act of Talbiyah. Where you say, Labbaik Allahumma Labbaik, Labbaik la sharika laka Labbaik, Inna alhamda wa ni'mata laka wal mulk la sharika lak. And our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, before he was going for Hajj, he said, Jibreel came to me and he commanded me that I should raise my voice when I say the Talbiyah. So Allah sent Jibreel to our Prophet ﷺ to tell him, to tell his ummah, that when they say the talbiyah, they should raise their voice. And this talbiyah, as we said, is not just for uh, hajj, it is also for umrah. And our Prophet ﷺ said that when the person gives talbiyah, everything that hears the talbiyah will intercede for that person on the day of judgment. So imagine every rock, every tree, everything that you pass that hears the talbiyah, the more you say the talbiyah, the more objects will testify that, Oh Allah, this person announced that he's coming for the Hajj and Umrah. He announced that he is answering your uh, call. Therefore, we should raise the voice with talbiyah and make it our regular routine as soon as we enter the ihram. Now for Umrah, we're only going to be in ihram literally for less than half a day. right? We're gonna, in our program, we're entering uh, ihram from outside of Medina. So from Literally, it's not even like Hajj, we have four or five days. It's literally less than half a day. Why don't we spend extra energy, mentally prepare ourselves that for those seven, eight hours, you know, or maybe even less than that, if the bus driver is driving the way that they drive usually, maybe even five hours, right? Uh, before we get from the Miqat to uh, Makkah, this is the time that we have, that we should raise our voice with Tatalbiya, that the bus should be buzzing with the talbiyah as much as possible so that we get our sins forgiven. And our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that whenever the person raises his voice with the talbiyah, the Prophet said everything on his right and left, even the hajar and the shajar, they start saying the talbiyah as well. So they, of course, we cannot hear it. But when the inanimate objects hear people saying the talbiyah, Allah Azza wa Jal gives them the ability. We don't know how. But everything will say the talbiyah along with our uh, talbiyah as well. And this is a good incentive as well for us to say the talbiyah as frequently as possible. And our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam also told us that touching the two uh, rukn, uh, the corners, which is uh, Hajr Aswad and Rukun Yamani, touching these two rukuns, uh, they're called the Ruknayayn, the two Rukuns. Touching these two Rukuns, it causes our sins to be forgiven. So we should try our best to physically touch uh, the two rukun and inshallah we're going at a time yeah it's not it's not uh, off season but neither is it peak season it's kind of in the middle so we're going at a time uh, that it's not hajj season alhamdulillah but of course it is the december break so a lot of people will come but inshallah we will be arriving in mecca relatively a little bit late around 9 10 p.m and uh, it's not going to be uh, it's going to be uh, a day that insha a night that inshallah ta'ala uh, it's not going to be the weekend over there so, relatively speaking, it will be a better time than uh, later on in the week or before that week. So, inshallah, my point is that for those of you that are still feeling energetic and young, maybe you can make your niyyah that at least one of the seven, I'm going to try to, uh, you know, touch the Hajar Aswad. Inshallah, we'll see. Play it by ear. I mean, obviously, if the rush is very bad, then we skip that. But uh, make it an, an intention. By the way, so touching the black stone doesn't have to be done only in the... Umrah. You can do it in any tawaf, 
in any tawaf. So suppose you come and it is too tired or too tired, you're too busy, no big deal. Okay, then just do the tawaf. The next day, stay awake late at night, you know, 2 a.m., 2.30 a.m. This is when, of course, the, the, the rush goes a little bit less. Then you do your tawaf and you make your niyyah that, inshallah, you know, I'm going to try my best to uh, touch the uh, hajr aswad. Because touching and kissing the hajr is, of course, an act of worship. And uh, it does forgive the sins, as our Prophet ﷺ said. And our Prophet ﷺ said that uh, never does a person raise a foot or put it down when they're going to the tawaf or the hajj or umrah. Never, in other words, whenever they're taking a journey to Mecca, never do you raise a foot or put it down, except that Allah will raise you one level or forgive a sin. So every single footstep to the Haramain, every single footstep to Mecca will give us that reward. And therefore, Alhamdulillah, we thank Allah we live so far away then. Because when we do go, now that farness becomes a blessing. That we are spending more money than a person, you know, from within uh, driving distance. We are spending more of our time. And we hope that inshallah, this long distance that we're going to travel, literally halfway across the world, that inshallah ta'ala, we will get the extra ajr uh, for that. And our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that the tawaf uh, of the Kaaba is just like the salah. But tawaf bil bayti salatun. So doing our tawaf around the Kaaba, we should be in the state of khushu' that we have during the salah because it is a type of salah except that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has allowed us to speak in the tawaf and we are not allowed to speak in the uh, salah. And our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would regularly uh, kiss or touch the black stone and we know that the black stone is of course uh, one of the stones that Allah sent through Jibreel to uh, the Prophet Ibrahim alayhi salam and it is a stone from the stones of Jannah and um, I have said before in a reminder here that if Allah does allow me or you or any of us to be right in front of the black stone and kiss it then just take a millisecond to make sure you're kissing at the right space right spot why? because I mentioned um, in the Sira class three and a half years ago and I showed you on, on our TV screen here I showed you that uh, when the Qaramilta, which was a radical Ismaili group in Bahrain, they came and they ransacked the Kaaba in, uh, was it 200 something, 270, whatever hijra, 200 something hijra, they ransacked the Kaaba, they stole the black stone, and they had to break it in order to get it out of the Kaaba. So it splintered. So the black stone splintered. And therefore, when the Abbasids got it back, they had to put pieces of the black stone in pure silver. So most of what you will see there is pure silver. And there's only some fragments of the black stone that are sticking out. The rest is embedded inside the silver. So, and you will see it clearly. Uh, you will see there's seven slithers, there's seven fragments of the, of the black stone. So when you kiss, if you're able to, and if not, then your life is more precious than trying to figure out where to kiss, okay? But if you're able to, then try to kiss on the actual black stone. And if not... Allah knows you stood in line, you tried your best to get there and you were able to do as much as you uh, can. And our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam encouraged the Sahaba by saying to them that Allah has made the tawaf and the safa and uh, the hitting of the jamarat, which we will not be doing, Allah has made it a symbol of iqama to dhikrillah. You are resurrecting and establishing the dhikr of Allah in this earth. So the tawaf and the sa'i and the jamarat. Now this is not jamarat time for us, but the tawaf and sa'i. This is iqama to dhikrillah. So this is establishing Allah's dhikr in this earth. And one of the simple realities of establishing Allah's dhikr, the tawaf is a non-stop act of worship. 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, 30 days of the month, 360 days. It keeps on going except for the actual salah and then immediately it starts again. So imagine our Prophet ﷺ saying the tawaf and the sa'i is a manifestation of Allah's dhikr on earth. And we see it non-stop. Isn't that the case? Never, ever does it stop. It's something that is a continuous act of worship. So just like Allah should be continuously worshipped, so too the people are doing tawaf non-stop since the time of Islam. Frankly, even before Islam, the mushrikun were doing tawaf, right? So that is a non-stop act of worship that is continuing throughout centuries and centuries. And nothing stops it. Even the salah, you stop just for the salah. Ten minutes we stop and then we resume again. So we should feel a part of this continual ritual 
that has been established from the time of Ibrahim. Now you too will take your part in doing that iqama to dhikrillah on this earth. And also we're going at a season that insha'Allah ta'ala we're able to we're able to take advantage of the uh, Multazam. And the Multazam is the place between uh, the Hajar al-Aswad and the door. There's a small area, around seven feet or six feet. It's not that much space. That our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that uh, what is between the Hajar and the, uh, the, the Bab or the door is a place that whatever a person asks for, Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala will give it to him. And our Prophet ﷺ, now this hadith, uh, a little bit of ikhtilaf, is it authentic or not? Some say it's slightly weak, some say it's authentic. Now, even if the hadith is a little bit weak, our Prophet ﷺ, we know for a fact he stood there for long periods of time. And he put his hands up and he beseeched Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this kind of makes this concept completely valid, that between the hajar, uh, Al-Aswad Between the Hajj Al-Aswad And the door of the Kaaba Between this is an area That is especially uh, Sacred for us That we should try our best To go and make dua over there And you don't have to do this In Tawaf You can do it at any time So when we're in Mecca Mashallah we'll be there You know f- uh, Four and a half days We'll be there in Mecca So any of that time uh, See what, when you can And if you're not able To touch your chest On the Kaaba Then even it's alright To take, take a step behind And just make dua You're still between the Hajr and the Bab. You're still between it. And especially for our sisters, of course, for them it is almost impossible to be able to touch uh, uh, the Kaaba at that, at that place. But after the Hajr al-Aswad, there's this big empty hole because everybody wants to touch the Hajr and then they want to leave. So in fact, the rush is not that much after the Hajr, right at the tip of the Kaaba. You get my point here, right? That it's literally as if there's like a vortex that goes you straight to the, the Hajr. And then after that, it just disappears because people just walk straight out. And so a foot or two after the Hajr al-Aswad, it is possible for our sisters in off-season, in the middle of the night, maybe 2 a.m., 3 a.m., it is possible for them to kind of come a little bit close and make dua between the uh, the, the Hajar al-Aswad and the door And again this is if they are able to reach that area Without physical harm and whatnot. And you be the ju- best judge of that uh, Your physical safety is more important Than standing at that particular place Also when we are in Mecca We should try our best to Fill ourselves with as much Zamzam as possible Try even to just stop drinking anything other than Zamzam And take a bottle and just fill it and use it in your hotel room as well For four or five days Just try your best to fill yourself with the water of Zamzam That our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said The best water in this uh, world is the water of Zamzam خَيْرُ مَا الْأَرْضِ مَا أُزَمْزَم This is the best water in this world And our Prophet ﷺ said مَا أُزَمْزَمَ لِمَا شُرِبَ لَهُ The water of Zamzam will get you the, the reason why you drank it Meaning, before you drink Zamzam You make the intention to Allah Why am I drinking Zamzam? You make a dua to Allah That, O oh Allah, uh, I want such and such O oh Allah, forgive my sins O oh Allah, bless my children O oh Allah, this and that And then you make dua so, uh, And then you drink So Drinking Zamzam is one of the causes of dua being accepted. So therefore, for that period that we are there, there we should increase drinking Zamzam as much as uh, possible. And uh, when we finish up the Hajj, and uh, sorry, the Umrah in this case, when we finish up the Umrah, then we know that we're supposed to be trimming uh, or shaving the hair. And our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam made special dua for those who shave. As you know, he said three times, Oh Allah, forgive those who shave, forgive those who shave, forgive those who shave. Then he said, forgive those who trim as well. So those who are able to shave, Alhamdulillah, that is good. And those who are trim, Alhamdulillah, that too is uh, good. And for those who are taking children for uh, Umrah, uh, or Hajj, wa, uh, a lady asked the Prophet Sallallahu she picked up uh, an infant that she had, and she said, Ya Rasulullah, can this child do Hajj or Umrah? Can this child come with me and, and do it? And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi said, yes, he may, and you will get the reward. So because you have to take care and you're going to be in charge, so those who are going with their children, then inshallah this too, there is a uh, a double reward because you are in charge of the uh, the children. And much more can be said, but um, some basic stuff that when we are doing, uh, so when we enter the ihram, we'll be doing talbiya and just do dhikr and dua, nothing other than that. When we get to Makkah, so the talbiya stops. When we get to 
Mecca. Uh, or when we see the Kaaba, some people say the Talbiyah stops. Some people say when you get to Mecca, it stops. Some people say when you get to the Haram, it stops. A slight controversy. Uh, and inshallah, I think when you see the Haram, you should stop the Talbiyah because then you've answered the call. Right? The point is that you're answering the call. What does labbaik mean? I said this uh, in the Hajj season when we gave the, the, the lecture about the Hajj. Labbaik means labba is a word that doesn't exist in English. It doesn't exist in English. Labba means that somebody called you, so I'm answering the call. Right? So I have to explain the whole thing in Arabic, in English. Otherwise, we don't have one word that translates as labba. Labba means that somebody invoked you, so you are saying, okay, I'm coming now. I'm answering the call. So this is what labba means. So labbaik Allahumma labbaik, I'm answering your call. So of course, the call is what Ibrahim's call that come for doing for the ta'zim of the uh, of the house of Allah for showing respect to the house of Allah. Wa adhim fin nasi, give the adhan proclamation for people to come and do hajj and of course Umrah as well to this house. So Ibrahim gave the adhan or he made the call. And we are answering that call. So we say, لَبَّيْكَ Allahumma. I'm answering the call. So when, when do you finish answering the call? When you arrive. So when do you arrive? When you see the haram. When you see the haram. And some people say when you see the minarets of the haram. Okay, maybe there's some people say when you see the Kaaba. It's technical, it's two minutes difference. So the point is that around that time, you stop the talbiyah. Then when you stop the talbiyah and you start the, you don't have to start the tawaf immediately. We will be tired. We will check into the hotel. Uh, you can take a, a shower if you want. And if you want, you can change the ihram even though there should not be a reason because this is not hajj. And hajj, we understand. You've been in ihram for two, three, four days. But in umrah, we're going to be in ihram for five hours. Five hours we're going to be in ihram, inshallah, not more than that, I hope six hours max. So there should not be any reason to change the ihram. But if somebody wants to change the ihram, uh, that is uh, uh, no problem in, in, in doing that. Uh, and then inshallah ta'ala, once we are ready and fresh. So our group, by the way, just a little bit of logistics. Uh, if you want to go by yourself, alhamdulillah, feel free to do so. And my honest and sincere advice, if you know how to do umrah, go on your own. Because umrah is an act of worship. And you want to do acts of worship on your own between you and Allah. Okay, Umrah is an act of worship. And you want to make your own dua, you want to be on your own pace. Going in a group, honestly, is not as good, personally speak, for, for, and just to be spiritual, right? Than going with yourself or your family. That you are now making your own duas and going as. But for those who are going for the first time, they're a little bit, let's say, concerned or, or, or a little bit, you know, wanting to know, then we will have. Three groups departing from the hotel. The timings will be told you later, but we'll have three groups, uh, one hour apart. So whoever wants to go in the first group, just meet in the lobby. We'll go as a group. Then the second group, and then the third group. And if we go in a group, realize that uh, the purpose of the group is just to be logistically together. Uh, I will not be doing group dua because I don't believe this is appropriate. You know, some some groups they go and the muallim will say, everybody repeat after me. Right? But in my opinion, this is against the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. That when you do tawaf, this is not like praying behind an imam that he recites Fatiha, you all say Ameen. This is your act of worship. We're only going as a group so that to give you some comfort that will take you where you need to go. We'll do seven times, then we'll, you know, some people are a little bit confused. How do I get to Safa and Marwa? Understandable. First time you're there, it's a little bit overwhelming. So for those who are there for the first time, then we will have three time slots. And maybe every time slot, whoever wants to go 10, 15, 20 will go every time slot. So we will have the three groups coming. And again, it is going to be just for logistical support. I will not, and I believe it is not right even. This is my position. It is not right for somebody to tell you what dua to make. You know your dua is best. And you know what you want to make dua, and you should make your own dua. It should come from your own heart, and your own tasbih, and your own Quran, whatever you want to do. It should be between you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So uh, we will just go as a, as a group just for the logistics. Uh, after we finish the seven uh, tawafs, so just a reminder, I hope you've all listened to the, the video, but if you haven't, please do listen to it. Just a reminder that uh, a lot of people make a trivial mistake, it's not the end of the world, don't worry, uh, that they make eight takbirat rather than seven. And this is not correct because you're supposed to do it odd. So when you begin, you say Bismillah when you begin. Then you say Allahu Akbar. And our Prophet ﷺ, if he wasn't able to touch or kiss the Hajr, he would point towards it. So for us, 99.9% .9 of us, we're not going to touch the Hajr Aswad, especially when we begin. Because we're going to begin on the outside. Then some of us might work our way in, but we always begin, most of us, on the outside. Okay? Uh, so we, we uh, move our hand or point our hands towards the uh, hajar, and we don't have to face 
the Hajar. You don't stop all the traffic and say, Allahu Akbar, you're not praying Salah. Okay? You, our Prophet was riding on his camel, he did not stop the camel. He did not stop the camel when he passed by the Hajar, uh, the black stone. He would simply point. So, if you're walking, you may just turn a little bit, but he did not stop. And so to stop is of course, as for those of us who have been, we know the number one cause of, of, of congestion is what? Is the stopping. Everything, you know, mess. and if they followed the sunnah, wallahi, it would be such an easy, even in peak season, even in peak season, if everybody's moving, then alhamdulillah. But the problem again is people just think they're doing better than the sunnah. We're not supposed to stop. Uh, so you, as you move along, you just say Allahu Akbar and you walk normal pace. So uh, uh, that is the first one, and you begin. So you, you begin every shout with the takbirah. You begin every circle with the takbirah. Now when you finish, you do not say the takbirah. And that's a small mistake. It's, your, your tawaf is not batil if you say it, it's just Allahu Akbar. But I'm saying you want to be precise, you don't say the takbirah at the end of the seventh. Now people feel weird. That I'm just walking away. Well, realize you're supposed to pray the two rak'ah. That's your ending of the tawaf. Okay? Realize that the, the, the point is that when you move on, then you go find a place and you pray the two rak'ah. That's like the seal of the tawaf. Now, the two rak'ah is sunnah. So if you don't pray it, then your tawaf is still valid. But technically, you don't do the Allahu Akbar when you pass the hajr at the finishing of the seventh round. Okay? And I've said this many times and I'll say it again. Do not ever think that you will remember the shot in your head. It's very common. I am, alhamdulillah, seasoned expert when it comes to hajj and umrah and tawaf. I have done more than I can count in terms of uh, umrahs. And yet still, I get confused sometimes. You're in the crowd, you're in the rush, and like, was it five? Was it especially around five and six? That's when it really... Then when you're in six, you're like, am I beginning the sixth or ending the sixth? Right? This is like always like, you know, okay, I know I'm the number six is in my head. Is it the beginning or the end? And you really get confused. So the easiest thing to do is to uh, have a marker on your hand. Just like keep your hand in a certain position. Or some people literally have a clicker or something. Or that's fine. Or they have a tasbih and they, they move it. That's fine as well. Uh, I'd rather just follow my hand. And so you just follow this and just say uh, that, okay, I'm in the first. Now, you need to decide when will you shift from one to two. At the beginning of one, are you at one or are you at zero? You understand? Because that changes everything, right? When you start, are you already on one? Because then when you finish one, you move to two. So then in reality, you're in the middle of two. Whereas if you finished one, then you move to one. Then, so you understand the point, right? You need to decide your own language to yourself. But I'm saying logistically speaking, is always a confusion. Suppose you're totally lost and you don't know which one you're on. You do in tawaf as you're supposed to do in salah, which is that you base on the yaqeen. So if you're confused between five and six, the yaqeen is five. If you're confused between four and three, the yaqeen is three. So you base on the yaqeen, get rid of the shak, which is the extra one, and then you go as if you're in the lower of the two. And then you continue, and uh, then that will be uh, acceptable. Uh, so after we finish the tawaf, we then uh, perform the two rak'at. It is almost impossible, even in off-season, to pray the two, two rak'at behind maqam Ibrahim directly. So you go, if possible, behind maqam Ibrahim far away. As for directly behind Maqam Ibrahim, you can only pray there when it is literally off, off, off season where the Hujjaj and the Mu'tamirin are very few. Maybe it would be mid-February these days or something of that nature. When nobody's coming in the middle of the night at 2 a.m. in February, you know something. Maybe at that time, then the tawaf is so few, you probably have you know, maybe a few hundred people, that's it. Okay, those are very difficult for people like us because we're working, we have jobs, whatnot. This is only for those who generally they live there or whatever. I mean, otherwise we we rarely get that. So for us, don't expect to pray directly behind Maqam Ibrahim. We will go far behind and try to have Maqam Ibrahim in front of us. Okay, so we'll try to go far behind, but still in the direction of Maqam Ibrahim. And if we can't find space even there, then okay, we'll just go somewhere else and pray. Uh, two rak'at and then after that the sunnah of our process was to fill up with zamzam so then after that you drink zamzam and zamzam is blessed water so you even 
pour it on yourself. He would even do wudu with Zamzam, no problem. So, uh, and there are fountains, as you know, taps uh, between uh, between the tawaf and the mas'a. And then, inshallah, we will do our uh, sa'i. Uh, I was very sad to see this year that they have put up barriers between the actual uh, mountains. You cannot touch Safa and Marwa anymore. Uh, and I'm very sad to see this. I grew up in the 1980s as a little child playing always. Every time I would go to, to Umrah, I would literally climb all the way to the top. This was my memories of uh, early 80s when I was a kid, seven, eight, nine years old, that every time we go, we'd go, I would go all the way to the top because I'm a kid, I love it, you know, and then come all the way down. This year I saw they actually put barriers. You cannot even touch Safa and Marwa anymore. It's now a relic. You just see it. I, as far as I know, that's still right now, but in Hajj for sure. In Hajj, you could not even uh, come to Safa and Marwa. You just come to a little bit of the base and then you have to go back. So we have to stick with the whatever the authorities say. And so we will go uh, seven times between Safa and uh, Marwa. And of course, we end the seventh time on Marwa. So you have to walk back anyway, but that doesn't count as a shot. That does not count as a... Uh, as, a, as, as one of the things And after you finish the seventh one Right there are the barber shops So our sisters can go back to the hotel They should have a small scissors with them That is travel safe, TSA friendly safe Or else that will be an issue So it's very healthy, healthy, helpful to the sisters To have their own uh, scissors They can use in the hotel room And for the brothers uh, They can just go to the barber shops Right after you finish Marwa There's hundreds of barber shops there So we can just go there And whoever wants to shave, shave Whoever wants to trim can trim and then of course we are done with the uh, umrah now uh, the qu common question that always comes up and i have given a much more detailed answer uh, in the video so you can see it for those who want to go for multiple umrahs so i said that this is a classical controversy dates back to the time of the sahaba so whoever wants to go they are free to do so of course logistically that's their business we will not provide a uh, second umrah that's you just take two riyals taxi uh, and just go to Masjid Aish and come back, that's up to you. Uh, not that difficult at all. And if you want to rent your own taxi, two riyals means you'll be stuffed with five people. But if you want to take your own, it'll cost you 15, 20 riyals and then you just go and you can even tell him to wait and he'll bring you back. Not a problem. Uh, it's really up to you and whoever wants to, alhamdulillah. Uh, I prefer the position that doing too many umrahs makes the sanctity of the Umrah not as holy anymore. It becomes routine. And our Prophet ﷺ, it was his sunnah and the sunnah of basically the Sahaba after him to do one Umrah per trip. And it makes the Umrah feel more special. But some people say, I want to do Umrah on behalf of my mother. She passed away. So, okay, for that, I understand. You know, I mean, it's not haram. It's not wrong. But also do realize that Yes, it is true that the asal or the general ruling is one umrah per trip because then you will feel more enthused, more, you will value the umrah more. Uh, but whoever wants to do it, then it's not a problem. That's, that's permissible. Uh, but some ulama would say this goes against the sunnah. Uh, and others, Imam Malik and others, were even more stricter in this regard. That in fact, Imam Malik and others did not even want a person to go for umrah twice a year because he said, I want to value the umrah. Don't make it a routine. So even he didn't want people to do Umrah even twice a year. He said Umrah should be once a year just like the Hajj. Don't go more than that. And not because he wants to not tell you to do worship, but because you want to keep the sanctity and the feeling of awe that you go for Umrah uh, in, in that feeling that you don't want to make it into a routine habit. Uh, so these are some of the main uh, points. And uh, inshallah ta'ala, when I open the floor for Q&A, uh, please realize that my Q&A right now is not logistics. Uh, it's about the fiqh. As for the logistics, what time and who and why, uh, that will be Brother Danish, inshallah, towards the end, come a little bit more about the logistics, about our particular uh, uh, package. Uh, but from my side, inshallah, we can now open the floor for uh, Q&A. So let's begin with our live audience here, and then uh, those brothers and sisters online as well, they can participate by uh, by emailing uh, or by emailing inshallah ta'ala uh, and you have received the email how to do that inshallah ta'ala so questions from our audience bismillah yes the, uh, are there any recommended or specific duas during the sari and dua or you can just say whatever you want are there any recommended duas between uh, for tawaf and sa'i uh, so there are some duas that our prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said and especially between the uh, Rukun Yamani and the Hajar Aswad, 
we know that he would say, Rabbana atina fi dunya hasana wa fil akhirati hasana wa qina adhab al So this is just for that last quarter of the tawaf. Uh, and when he would start the safa and the marwa. So there's a long dua that you will find in your booklets of Umrah, uh, booklets of Hajj and Umrah. He would stand on safa and on marwa, face the qibla and say, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. He would say uh, for um, uh, that... Uh, uh, Sadaqa wa'da wa nasra abda wa azza junda wa hazam al hazaba wa'da la ilaha illallah wa lan abdu illa ya mukhlisin al dina wa kari al kafirun. And then he would make long duas. So this is on Safa and then on Marwa. So there are certain things narrated. But for the bulk of it, we just do a regular dhikr. Regular dhikr or open up a mushaf, very good. You open up a Quran, you have your phone, use your iPhone with the Quran, just read some Quran and just make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay. Uh, hand was on this side, yes. Trimming is anything that constitutes trimming. So if somebody uh, sees you and sees that you've had a trim, then this is trimming. As long as it's something that is... So it must be for the entire area, right? And if one of us is bald, I'm getting bald myself as well, uh, you are not bald, you are half bald. So give yourself half credit. (laughs) So, So if somebody is bald, then the scholars say for him, he should just... Ta'abbudan, just as an act of ibadah, just uh, put the shaving over his hair just to show Allah Azza wa that he's doing it, even though he doesn't have hair. Okay, so, yes. So if you do multiple umrah, and uh, at the end of the first umrah you did shave, the next umrah, what are you going to shave? You, like we just said, so you will just shave even if there's nothing. You will just do it ta'abbudan ilallah, just as a showing Allah that this is an act of ibadah. Okay, yes, sister, go ahead. Yes, you can trim your own hair. Not a problem at all. We have a question from online that um, uh, can I take a shower once we arrive in Mecca? Uh, and the sister is saying, can we change our, our garments and undergarments because we might be uh, tired or sweaty or whatnot? Yes, as we said, you can take a shower and you can change all the garments. Uh, even for the men, they can change into another ihram if they so want to. And for the sisters, if they want to change whatever they're wearing, they may do that as well. A uh, question from online, giving the Ebola breakouts, is it permissible to wear a mask and do the kafara, or is this not a valid excuse? So um, I'm not going to talk about the medical issue of whether one should wear mask or not from a medical perspective. That's up to you and your doctor. And how effective that is, that's not my business. But from a fiqh perspective, if you uh, feel that you wish to wear a mask, scholars differ this surgical mask in our times. Is it one of the things that breaks the uh, conditions of ihram? Not breaks, but breaks the the shurut or the the, um, the issues that are haram in ihram. Does it break it or not? Because it's not fully covering the face. It's just covering the mouth and the ear. So how technical do you want to be? There are one group that says that this is not really covering of the face. It's just covering the nose and the breathing apparatus, right? So they say no kafara is needed. And another group of modern scholars says, no, it is covering the face because it covers basically most of the face. So they say go with the majority. So it is a gray area. And alhamdulillah, the kafara is very affordable for us from America, right? It's not something that is, so you feed six people, for example. So you buy food for six people and then you give it to the people. uh, You can see they deserve the food and that's enough for a kafara. So, my suggestion would be, even though technically fiqh-wise I sympathize with those who say it's not covering the face, no kafara is needed. But just to make your heart at ease, we're allowed to break some of the uh, shurut of ihram, we're allowed to break them if there is a legitimate need. And for the one who is genuinely scared of Ebola and they feel it is a legitimate need, and that's not my business to say whether it's legitimate Ebola or not in Jeddah or Saudi that's not my business. You ask the doctors. But if you feel that it is something you are worried about, then you may wear the mask. There's no sin on you. And just for your own heart's sake, I will say feed six people. Even though technically I say, I don't see this as breaking the ihram because you're not covering the entire uh, face. Uh, if we finish the tawaf, during the makru timings of salah, should we pray to sunnah or not? This is a classic controversy that dates back 1,390 years, back to the earliest tabi'un, taba tabi'un, that this is the classic controversy. Suppose you uh, did your tawaf after asr, 
and you finished still after Asr is before Maghrib, what do you do? So three of the madhahib say that, actually two and a half, because one of the madhahib has two, two riwayat, say that you wait until Maghrib, then you pray two rak'ah. And one and a half of the madhahib, basically one and one riwayat, say that you should go ahead and pray. And in my humble opinion, uh, it makes sense that in the haram in Mecca, there is no makruh timings, because the Kaaba is in front of you. And I kind of sympathize with this opinion, that there is no makruh timings when you finish the tawaf, you pray your two rak'ah because the Kaaba is right there. So the confusion that somebody might have, are you worshipping the sun or whatnot, it will never happen inside of the haram. And this is an opinion within the Hanbali Madhab and other madhahib that there is no makruh timings for the Makkah Kaaba itself. And in any case, yes, if you want to pray immediately, not a problem there. Can we drink Zamzam at any time or just between... Um, Tawaf, or sorry, 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 yeah, between Tawaf and Sa'i, Safa and Marwa, is it a legislated sunnah? So you may drink Zamzam at any time, even when you're doing Tawaf and Sa'i, you can drink Zamzam. Uh, but it is especially a sunnah between the Tawaf and the Sa'i. It is especially a sunnah because our Prophet ﷺ did it. So just because he did it, we should follow it. Okay, so when you finish the Tawaf, on your way to Sa'i, you just stop and there are, they actually have a place over there Lots of taps for Zamzam because of the Sunnah. So we should try our best to uh, do it. Um, somebody already asked if I do two Umrahs and I shave after the first, what do I do for the second? I already said this to our brother that if you have shaved and the next day you go for Umrah, you still are completely bald, go ahead and just symbolically shave. Even if you just purchase a safety razor from down there and just quickly do it yourself, just to show Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that you have done the, uh, the shave. So you just do it symbolically, just like we do tayammum symbolically. There's no water. But we're showing Allah azza wa that we are uh, doing it. Once you finish the Umrah, what are the recommended acts of worship in Mecca? Tawaf, tawaf, tawaf. As much tawaf as possible. Between every salah, just go to tawaf. As much tawaf as you can do. Number one. Number two, dua. One of the main reasons we're going to Mecca is to make special duas for our needs. Because the dua of Mecca is one of the most precious duas. So we go to Mecca to make those du'as. We should have in our head. Some of us write it down, no problem. Some of us put Word documents or whatever, Google documents, no problem. So that you know what du'as you want to make, keep it in mind. So lots of du'a over there. And then every good deed, Quran, dhikr, uh, sadaqa. In fact, uh, what I recommend people to do uh, is to tell their family and friends that look, I'm going to Mecca, give me any charity you want. Any extra charity you have, give it to me. I'll be as long as you're a trustworthy guy, obviously. <laughs> so, inshallah, we're not telling you to stuff for Allah, do something. So, if you're a trustworthy guy, so anybody has $550, $20. So, now you have, mashallah, $1,000 sadaqah, right? You have five days in Mecca, and there are so many people. And what I tell our brothers and sisters, especially the number one person's people you should give in the haram are the workers of the haram. Those people that are dressed in the, the, the cleaning uh, clothes, they are paid. Literally pennies. Poor people. Wallahi, I mean, you feel for them. They're treated in a way that is really heartbreaking. Many of them are genuinely good Muslims. You see, mashallah, the big beers and they, they feel enthusiastic. They get paid maybe $100 a month or something. You know, maybe $150 now. When I was there, when I was there living, the guy told me he gets paid less than, like it was $300, less than $100 a month. Now, can you imagine? He has to send money home. And he has to take care of himself and this and that. Yeah, and these people, you know, so, and I know this hurts for to say this, but my general philosophy is not to give to a professional beggar. This is my general philosophy. Now, this is my opinion. You can take it or leave it. I do not give to professional beggars because I have lived there too long to know these are gangs. These are scams. And what is really, really pathetic is that the leaders and masterminds of these scams, they are creatures. They are animals. They take innocent babies and they deform them. So that you see all of these kids without a hand, without this. Where do they come from? Now, of course, the flip side, somebody says it's not the kid's fault. I agree with you, it's not the kid's fault. But where is that money going? It's not going to the kid. Wallahi, I wish I could do something at a... National level, you know, can they help these kids. But in the end of the day, these are gangs. And they take these children, astaghfirullah, they mutilate them, they do this and that. And then you, that's why I remember once somebody said to me, why is it that, that Mecca is full of deformed people? 
deformed beggars. I haven't seen these deformed beggars anywhere in the world. You know, the reason is because these are gangs. It's a very sad thing that happens there, and there are professionals that are doing this. So, it's a sad reality. I mean, you know, I don't know what to what to tell you. I don't know what to tell you. And these children, these young people, and then eventually these children get older, and you see, you know, men and women, all elderly, without an arm, without a limb. I mean. I'm sure some of them are genuine, I'm sure. But I know for a fact that the scams and the professionals are more. So my philosophy is I never give to uh, you know, these. And you, you just keep your eyes open and you'll find a, a family from this country, from that country living out in the haram. You see they don't have anything. They have their bags with them. They can't even afford a hotel. Give to them. Why would you want to give to somebody that you know they have made their life into begging but this is my advice by the way it's up to you and you know i mean i'm not telling you not to give to them uh, from a fiqh perspective this is your position or whatnot but for me personally i i cannot give to them when i know there are genuine people that are not asking they have dignity they deserve the money so if you find a thousand i mean if you collect a thousand dollars that's mashallah three thousand seven hundred that's a good amount you know so you give these workers 200 300 reals for them that's a good amount and if you find somebody really good yeah 500 why not i mean these people they're living single lives their wives and children are back home you know they cannot they're not allowed to live with their families sometimes they go back once every two or three years to visit their children i mean speak to them wallahi they all speak urdu anyway i mean you know most of them are you know urdu bengali speakers anyway speak to them where are you from? You know, tell me about. And you will see, man, their stories are so genuinely, you know, heartbreaking. How could you not help out this guy? So my opinion is there are plenty of people to help out. So collect the money from family and friends and make this another act of worship. The question was what acts of worship? This is one of the things that is so easy to do. You just become the medium. Allah will reward you because the money is in your pocket, not even because you gave it. You're collecting from family and friends. Give me some money, by the way. So collect some family and friends, inshallah, and we'll go and we'll give it to, uh, to, uh, to the people in Makkah. Um, so uh, is, it, is the dua during Sa'i, uh, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, that he has a long dua, supposed to be said at the top of Safa and Marwa all seven times. So as I said, our Prophet ﷺ, when he began the Sa'i at Safa, and then at Marwa, and then Safa and Marwa, he would stop and face the Qibla and stand there for a long period of time. This is Sunnah. It is of the finer Sunnahs. Many times people don't have the time to do that. They're, they're tired, they're with family. So if you just walk, it is completely fine. No problem. But our Prophet would spend a good amount of time on the mountain making dua to Allah. So yes, it is Sunnah all seven times. Once again, when you finish the seventh, you don't stand. You just walk out. And the finishing is the shaving or the trimming. Just like when you finish the seventh tawaf, you don't do takbir. Similarly, when you finish the seventh sa'iz, you don't stand. You just walk and you are done. So yes, the response is all seven are uh, sunnah to do. Uh, the brother says that when I shave my hair, do I have to shave my mustache as well? No, you don't have to shave your mustache uh, or your beard. Uh, you may keep that, inshallah. In fact, you should keep the beard. You should trim the mustache as the sunnah. But you don't have to do it at the ihram timing. Um, so the sister is saying that she will be in her menses most likely. What is permissible in Medina and Mecca uh, in the time of the menses? So uh, if you feel that you will be in menses for all of those days in Mecca, this is a bit of a problem. Because we'll be in Mecca for four and a half days. So if you feel your ada, your routine is such that uh, it will be overlapping that entire stay, then this is a bit of a problem. And uh, wallahi, I mean, honestly, this is not uh, in your hands, of course. Uh, in this case, I actually suggest speaking to your doctor and seeing if you can take uh, medication that will not be harmful, as long as it's not harmful, so that you will be able to delay uh, the menses. Even though I don't like interfering with the natural cycle, but in this particular case for Hajj and Umrah, it actually makes sense once in a lifetime or once every few years that you uh, delay it for a few days, if it is possible. If not, if there's any other reason, or I think it might even be too late to start the procedure, we have some doctors here, maybe it'll be too late even right now because we're leaving in two weeks. F for whatever reason, if that is not the case, then in this case, 
books of fiqh would say that you should remain in Mecca until you're able to do the Umrah. This is what the, because in those days there were no flights. If you had to wait a day or two, you'd wait a day or two, then catch up quickly because your caravan will be going slowly. If you're by yourself with your husband, they can be faster to catch up. So the books of fiqh would say that you just wait until your mensas are over and then you finish up and then catch up with your caravan. And that's a very good opinion. I suggest to you if you're able to do that, and it is technically you can, even in our group, it's not hajj, which means the flights are negotiable. In Hajj, the flights are almost set in stone. In Umrah, the flights are negotiable. Speak with Dawud Salam, see if it can be arranged. If it cannot be arranged and you are not able to do this, then in this uh, uh, position, you must follow the Darura opinion. I don't like saying this, but it is a Darura. And that is that you perform the uh, Tawaf in that state, even though I don't like to do this, but it is a Darura. There is no other alternative. You're in Ihram, you need to do it in that state. It's like the one who cannot do wudu and cannot t- touch his water. What should he do? He simply prays in that state. It's a Darura. It's not the general rule. So if, if that is the case, then you have no alternative. And speak to me, inshallah. You're coming at my group, so speak to me and we can go in more detail. As for Medina and what you can do, uh, I mean, you can do all the other acts of worship. Uh, you can do all of the other du'as and dhikr. Of course, you're just not going to pray salah. That's it. And you can go to the courtyard of the haram and just sit in the courtyard of the haram. I would suggest you don't go inside the haram. But even if the person went inside, there is a controversy should the woman in menses, is she allowed to go inside the masjid or not? Some madahib say yes, some madahib say no. So it's not something that is ijma or clear cut. There's a gray area. So if you just to be on the safe side, stay in the courtyard. You know the large courtyard outside of Medina. Stay in that. And in the haram as well. Stay in the courtyard outside. Don't go inside the physical structure until the menses are uh, over. Question. I want to perform hijama. Can you suggest anybody? You know what? I will find out for you. Yes, I can. But I'm not responsible. What is hijama? Blood sucking. <laughs> cupping. Uh, cupping. You cut and you... Um, you know, you do that. But, but I will tell you a people, but it's up to you to trust them or not. I can easily find out for you. I have good friends who know, would know people who do hijab. Okay? But it's your liability, not mine. So it's say that. Yeah, the thing is, where are you going to do the hijab? Which part of your body? If you do it on the back of your head, uh, there are going to be vicious gashes. It's not that bad. Uh, huh? What's the significance? Our Prophet ﷺ praised hijama more than he praised any other shifa. He praised hijama as a means of curing more than any other shifa. There are over 20 ahadith about the blessings of hijama. Cupping. Cupping. Right? So bloodletting, and you, like you, you and. No, 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 no. The brother is just asking. He wants to do hijama. It's nothing to do with Umrah. No, you can do hijama at any time of your life. Nothing to do with Umrah. But, but the thing is, yeah, the 16th, the 5th, the 13th, 14th, 15th is the best time. But the thing is, because you're going to shave your hair in Mecca, and because the most common place of hijama is the back of the head, so a lot of people, they want to do hijama in Medina, because then when they go to Mecca, then the hair will be shaved anyway. Because if you were to do hijama at any time of the year in here, they'll have to shave half of your hair. And that looks very awkward. That's why a lot of people combine the hijama with the umrah because of the shaving. That's the only reason. Otherwise, you don't have to get hijama in the back of the hair. You can get in the head. You can get, and depending on what your ailment is, now you go to the hijama, it's a doctor. It's a Alternative medicine doctor, just like these other alternative medicines, uh, acupuncture and whatnot. There's alternative. So there are doctors that are doctors of hijama, and they train in that field. So you tell them, I have headaches. Now the most common thing, uh, I have had plenty of friends. They have told me this that they have migraines or, and the, and the hijama helps them. Plenty of friends. I have never done it. Uh, I've never, alhamdulillah, had that issue of migraines or not. But a lot of my friends have done it, and they have told me it has helped them immensely. And so, I mean, whoever wants to, I mean, that's their business. I can help you. So the brother who asked the question, inshallah ta'ala, I will find out for you. But again, 
liability is yours. You go and you judge the guy yourself. I'll just tell you that this has been recommended by my own friends. But other than that, it is yours. Um, so are we allowed to drink caffeine during Umrah? <laughs> I will drink my mocha in Mecca and you will see me, inshallah ta'ala. Uh, you will see me doing that. So you will find, see, inshallah, that it is halal, inshallah, to drink a mocha in Mecca. Okay, other questions. We're done of this here. Yes. Uh, so do we have to have wudu uh, during tawaf and sa'i the majority opinion is that yes you should have wudu and it is the safer opinion uh, to do and therefore inshallah ta'ala you should have wudu however Ibn Taymiyyah and others uh, they they felt that it is not necessary uh, to have wudu before you do tawaf so my suggestion to the people that come with my group is the following. Always make sure you have wudu before you go. But in case your wudu breaks in the middle of the tawaf, then inshallah ta'ala you can resort to Ibn Taymiyyah's opinion because there's no explicit evidence to say that you have to have wudu before doing tawaf. Okay? Tawaf. As for sa'i, no scholar in the history of Islam ever said you have to have wudu. By unanimous consensus, Sa'i, you don't have to have wudu. There's no ikhtilaf at all. The ikhtilaf is over tawaf. Okay? Well, once uh, we start doing tawaf, uh, is it, uh, you have to finish it or can you break it? Come so the brother is saying if we have to break the middle of the tawaf uh, and then come back. So our scholars say if the break is trivial and for a reason, then you may resume from where you left off. Classic example is salah. If the break is trivial and for a reason, salah will take three, four, five minutes and it's for a legitimate reason, no problem. If the break is long and for no reason, not a legitimate reason, then you start from the beginning. Okay? Yes, go ahead. Are you coming with us this year? No, next year, inshallah, you're coming. Make the knee, inshallah. Next year, you're coming, inshallah. Next year, I told him. Next year, inshallah. Khalas, we have a witness in the back that will make sure you live up to your promise. <laughs> Yes, between the Hajj Aswad and the door. That's basically the corner. You know? Yes, the corner. It's around six, seven feet. It's not that small. You can easily have eight, nine people squeezed in. And then even if you don't touch it, you're in the second, third, fourth row. You have the men squeezed up. Inshallah. But I see most people, they are doing it between the door and the Muslim. You mean the door and the Hijr? The door and the... Yeah, so that's the hijr, yeah. That, 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 is not, that is not the sunnah place to do it. Yeah, it's not the sunnah place, but neither is it wrong. Anywhere in the Kaaba is good. So anywhere over there is good, but the, the most blessed place is between the hijr aswad and the door. Okay, yes. So the brother is saying, is it an act of worship to merely look at the Kaaba? There is a fabricated hadith that says that merely looking at the Kaaba is ibadah. The hadith is fabricated. However, looking at the Kaaba should make your iman go up and you should feel a sense of khushu' and humbleness and thankfulness that you are there. And that is definitely a part of iman. So yes, but there's no hadith. But there's no hadith that looking at the Kaaba is is ibadah. But looking at the Kaaba should make you feel emotions of ibadah. And in those emotions, you should make dua to Allah. Yes. And wallahi, it is a sign of weakness of iman if being in front of the Kaaba and you are not moved. Isn't that the case? You know, I mean, if you're in front of the Kaaba and you're not feeling that awe, this is a problem. You know, so this is a sign of weakness of Iman. So we have a question from online uh, that can I pray in the hotel with the congregation? Uh, my dear brother or sister, Wallahi, I respect you. You're coming with my group. But why are you coming all the way there to pray in the hotel? I mean, you have spent money and you have spent time. And now 
I understand, wallahi, in Hajj, I fully understand. The timings of Hajj, it's crazy. And I prayed in the hotel lobby. You know, when you go down, it is literally connected to the haram. I prayed there because by the time you get there, you cannot even go outside of the... You go 15 minutes before, you cannot even go outside. I understand. But we are not going at that peak season. And if you leave 10 minutes before, you will easily get to maybe even Saf al-Awwal on the roof if you're a brother. Maybe even the front row, you can see the haram beneath you. So I would say unless you are elderly or sick, why would you want to do that? right? And as for the fiqh perspective... If the sufuf are not connected, then you praying in the hotel lobby or the hotel musalla will not constitute the jama'ah. Because the sufuf have to be connected. And when are the sufuf connected? Taraweeh and hajj. Otherwise, the sufuf are not connected from uh, the haram to any of the hotels. It's not that busy. You know, I mean, unless things have changed dramatically, I don't think. I mean, it's not, I haven't been in December for many years, but I don't think it's that busy. Yes? Uh, is there any um, benefit or anything to talk about praying in the Hatim? Yes, praying in the Hatim is highly encouraged because praying in the Hatim is the same as praying inside of the Kaaba. So you will get the rewards and following the Sunnah of praying inside of the Kaaba because the Hatim is inside the Kaaba and it is a mercy from Allah. The Hatim is the semicircular round thing, right? The Hatim is inside the Kaaba, and Allah, in His wisdom and mercy, before the before the prophethood began, what happened? We all know that the Quraysh ran short of funds, and so they built the Kaaba smaller than they should have, and this was Allah's design, because that is why to this day that area is open. Otherwise, it was closed for four thousand years. Imagine. For 4,000 years since Ibrahim's time up until the Prophet Muhammad's time, it was closed. And the Quraysh would prevent people from going inside except those whom they allowed. Just like every Islamic government did the same thing. Even to this day, to go and pray inside, you need to get royal permission. In some ways it makes sense. Imagine if they opened the door, what would happen? Just imagine. If they opened the door, there would be mobs and people would die. You understand this. You need a permission and a special whatnot once a year, twice a year that happens. Uh, so it makes sense. So what has Allah Azza wa Jalla in His wisdom done instead? The Hatim is open. So the Hatim is the Kaaba, inside the Kaaba. When you are praying there, you are praying inside the house of Allah. And so it is definitely a place we should try to go pray in. Technically, you can pray in any direction, but been, since everybody is facing the Kaaba, you would look very weird <laughs> if you turned around and did it. Yes? Um, my question uh, is regarding Hajj. Yes. Uh, and it's kind of like a precaution for the brothers and sisters. Uh, I had a um, positive experience when I was in Medina eight times. MashaAllah, MashaAllah. Yes, it does. Zamzam has a unique flavor. It is not the same as regular wine. Mm -hmm. And I was so uh, inspired by my own experience, I bought a big jug, maybe five or ten gallons, uh, to bring and share it with uh, everybody in my family. And, but, uh, you know, this will cure you. Uh, anyway, when I opened it after we got, we, we stopped on our way. On the way back here, and um, it was the flavor was to me it tasted just like regular wine, in spite of the fact that it had the label on that jug that I purchased 
had the name of the king of Saudi Arabia, um, uh, uh, Sahbi or something, but it had the king's name. So I cannot answer to this, obviously. Maybe the guy told you wrong. So sometimes what they do is they take the bottle, which is legitimate, and they refill it with regular water to sell. Yes, in fact, my brother-in-law, who uh, I accompany, he brings in an empty jug with him and fills it there. Yes, there. Now, if you, if you purchase Zamzam from uh, the, the places within the vicinity of the haram, those, uh, the, the immediate places, generally speaking, they're not doing scams, generally speaking. But there are people that will take that bottle. Now, the bottle is legitimate because if it has that on it, they have a ministry for Zamzam affairs or they have a branch of the ministry. So if it has that stamp on it, the bottle is legitimate. But then what happens is there's, astaghfirullah, a black market of Zamzam. Can you believe? Right? Wallahi, this is the state of our ummah, that there's a black market of false Zamzam. So they'll take the bottle and they'll just sell you the regular water and they'll earn living off of that. So, yeah, so I can't, yeah, I mean. Okay, alhamdulillah, inshallah. Keep that point in mind, inshallah. Make sure the Zamzam is the real one. Uh, so we have questions from online. Um, is the dua at the first sight of the Kaaba mustajab or accepted? Uh, it is authentically narrated that some of the Sahaba, when they first saw the Kaaba, would stop dead in their tracks and make long dua. So whoever wants to do that, that is good. But there is nothing from the Prophet in this regard. So some of the Sahaba, when they're walking in and they saw the Kaaba, they would stop there. But also look at the people behind you. If you're going off season and it's empty, then go behind the pillar and make dua, no problem. But if there's a long line behind you, keep that in mind and don't stop the line. Yes. During the Salah, should one look at the Kaaba or look down? This is another classic controversy that goes back 1,200 years from the ancient times that in Mecca, should you look still down or look at the Kaaba? And technically speaking, uh, one would say the Sunnah is always to look down. Uh, but it is my position that if our Iman is very weak, and looking at the Kaaba increases our khushu' in the Salah, then the goal of having khushu' is more important. So if you feel that looking at the Kaaba will increase your khushu' then having khushu' is more important. So in my opinion, it is not a problem to do so. In any case, nobody would say it's a makroor or haram. Nobody would say that. But the issue is which is better, to look down or look at the Kaaba? And my response is whichever one gives you more khushu' is better. We have a question from online um, that is there more reward for staying in the haram? Uh, example, sleeping there uh, and to spend most of the time in the haram. Uh, there's nothing inherently more rewarding if you sleep in the haram versus sleeping in your, uh, in your uh, hotel room. So it's not, you should not make it your goal that you're going to spend the night in the haram. Uh, but whoever wants to spend more time there, no doubt it is better in your wakeful state to go and sit in front of the Kaaba and read Quran and do dhikr, no doubt. But in and of itself, it's not something that you should prefer to spend the night inside of the haram rather than inside of your uh, hotel. Even though it is narrated that sometimes the Prophet slept in the haram. In fact, according to one opinion, Isra al Mi'raj took place when he was sleeping in the haram. According to one opinion, uh, that he was sleeping in front of the Kaaba. And it is common, and you will find people sleeping there in front of the Kaaba, but there's nothing inherently more rewarding to sleep in the haram. Rather, I would say it is better for your dignity, men and especially women, there's no question, men even, it is better for your dignity and whatnot that you sleep in the regular place than go in an alertful and wakeful state uh, to the haram. Uh, mother says that uh, she might have to uh, breastfeed her child uh, during the tawaf. Can she stop and then resume? Uh, we said, yes, you may stop in this case. If there is a need, you may legitimately uh, yani go to the side and cover yourself and feed the child and then resume from where you left off because this is a small amount of time, you know, 15 minutes or so, that is acceptable that you are a mother that needs to take care of the infant. Uh, can I make wudu with zamzam? Not just can you, you should make wudu with zamzam. It is sunnah to make wudu with zamzam. You should make wudu with zamzam. Is there something called farewell tawaf for the umrah trip? No. There's nothing called farewell tawaf. You don't have to do the last thing as a uh, tawaf, uh, but some scholars have said out of etiquette you should. 
but there's nothing in the sunnah. But some have made qiyas and they've said, okay, just like hajj, you know, there's the farewell tawaf. So similarly, there should be one in umrah, but there's nothing, there's nothing legal, but it is a matter of etiquette, adab. So I would also suggest that it is good and healthy that you do a tawaf before you leave, but it is not wajib. It's not wajib. Unlike hajj, it is wajib to do the farewell tawaf. Um, someone says about bleeding uh, during the ihram and tawaf. Bleeding does not break anything to do with uh, the ihram and the, the, the wudu. So if somebody is, now we're talking about bleeding, we're talking about somebody stepping or my, and, uh, I have a nail bleed, that type of bleeding. Obviously the feminine blood is another issue that's you're in the menses. But any other type of bleeding, a cut or a scar, uh, somebody steps on you, that bleeding does not break anything of the ihram or of wudu. So if it's a s- small scratch that you don't have to worry about, continue. If it's a severe thing, you need to get treatment for it. That's a separate issue. Uh, but it's not going to break your tawaf or your wudu. Uh, how long are we going to go, Danish? Because five more questions. Five more uh, Do you send them? Okay, let me. Uh, okay, any questions from the audience here? Yes, go ahead. It's always better uh, to raise the hands when you can. So if you are doing tawaf and you just want to raise the hands, it's not a problem. Uh, it's always better. The general rule is to raise your hands during dua, but you don't have to. And you may simply uh, make your dua from your tongue without raising the hands during tawaf. This is also allowed. Inshallah, when we talk about the logistics, but there's no rituals in Medina other than extra prayer. But inshallah, when we talk about what we're going to be doing, uh, we will go over uh, some other things to be done in Medina, inshallah ta'ala. There was a hand over here from the brothers as well. huh? There, yes, go ahead. The selfie in the background. <laughs> you had to ask, didn't you, right? Uh, you, I knew you would be the one asking. <laughs> Can you take a selfie of the Kaaba? Huh? <laughs> I'm stand. Wallahi, there was a big controversy, right, online. Um, what can I say? It's not haram. If you want to do it and you feel that this is uh, something you like to do, it technically it's not haram. It's it's something that. What can I say? It's, I, I don't feel comfortable doing it myself, and I feel very. Odd, but this is my personal personality, if that makes sense. It's my personality. I don't think it's something, but wallahi, it really depends on why you're doing it and what is your intention. I mean, for some people, for some people, doing that would be a type of encouragement to their friends that are not that practicing, that, man, I want to be there too. If that's his niyyah, that he wants to make them feel come as well, then inshallah it's halal, you know. Uh, and for the one who wants to show off, there's no doubt that this would be haram. And you're going to show off in front of the Kaaba, it's like, dudes, you're like really messed up priorities, man. Alhamdulillah. Yes, go ahead. During the air travel, you guesstimate. So you figure out what time am I getting on the plane, what time will it be when I land? And then you guesstimate looking outside of the window. Roughly speaking, what time will it be? And it is not that difficult. I mean, you look at and see where the sun is. You're never cloudy. You're above the clouds. So you just look outside and you make a judgment call. And if you board the plane after Maghrib, and some of our flights are boarding after Maghrib, then you pray Maghrib and Isha in the airport. Right? So you're, you're scot-free there. If you board before Maghrib, then you pray Maghrib and Isha within an hour or two after sunset. You pray both. And then you pray Fajr before you land. Because by the time you get there, it will be uh, most likely, uh, depending which flight you're taking, actually. Oh, okay. So then in that case, we will have to we'll pray Dhuhr and Asr at the airport. Maghrib and Isha. And even Fajr. What time are we landing? Yeah. Yeah, so even Fajr will have to pray. So we'll pray Maghrib and Isha and Fajr on the plane. Okay. We have a. Yeah, there's an app. What is it called again? We can tell. S O A R I N G. Soaring. There's an app that will tell you the timing of the, timing of the salah in the plane. 
No, where you are, it will tell you. It won't tell you the timing of salah. The current time of where you are in the plane. Yeah, the current time of where you are in the plane, you will find out. Okay. We have a question from online. Should we pray to Sunnah after Tawaf during Makru? We did this, Danish, number one. We did that. Number two, uh, if doing multiple Umrahs, can the rituals of Umrah be performed at any hour of the day, provided you get to the Miqat and start your state of Ihram? Yes. Umrah can be done at any time of the day or night. There's no restriction on that. Do we pray the prayer of the Musafir while in Mecca and Medina? Or should we pray all of our Sunnah? So uh, you are a Musafir. There's no doubt about that. But you should not be lazy and praying extra Nawafil. So even if you don't pray Sunnah Ratiba, you should pray double, triple that in Nafil. Okay? So you are a Musafir. But you are going to be praying extra Nafil because... How can you give up a hundred thousand reward? Think about that. How can you give that up? You should be praying every opportunity you get. Just pray two rakat. That's a hundred thousand on the day of judgment, and a thousand in Medina. Um, so uh, we have a long question. The Saudi authorities tell my wife not to pray close to the Kaaba to say segregated. Uh, the Saudi security would take my wife, uh, tell her to go away when she was praying next to me. Is there a religious justification that women shouldn't pray on the first level near to the Kaaba? So uh, we don't have the you know s- security rulings in our control. We can only do what they tell us what to do. So if there is a... And this is only typically at peak timings. When it's empty, then the security also gets lax. And uh, their main reason is logistics. That... Uh, it just becomes awkward with so many women are praying in one area and the men are doing tawaf. The main reason is logistics. This is not a defense of them. They have their rules of doing it. So if the security guards tell you to go elsewhere, then khalas, you go elsewhere. And Allah knows you tried to pray uh, behind the maqam Ibrahim. Can we donate Qurans to be placed in the haram? No, do not donate Qurans to be placed in the haram. There is a factory specially made for this purpose that we are going to visit. So no, we don't need to donate Qurans uh, for the haram because they have plenty of Qurans. Rather, inshallah, for the men amongst us, you will be donated a copy of the Quran, inshallah. Why do I say this? Because the women are not, are not allowed to go to the factory, uh, the Medina factory. It's not my, my control. Their rules, only men can go in. So inshallah, we are still 100% confirming, but inshallah, the brothers will get to go to the uh, factory and you can get a Quran uh, fresh from the printing press, inshallah. Yes, we need to take our final question, then we are done. That can women wear socks during ihram anytime? Yes, not even can, they should wear socks. It is preferable for them to wear socks uh, anytime. Yes, they should wear socks inside, inside the state of ihram. Uh, inshallah, with that, we will, uh, Badaj, you need to make some logistics or at least tell them about the logistics. No, we're, we're done. We're not going to go over the, you're not, you're not going to. Okay, so uh, as for the logistics, uh, you will get an email tomorrow, inshallah, with all of the logistical details. And then there should be another phone call with uh, uh, next weekend with Brother Danish. All of the logistical questions about what timing and who's going to do this and where would I put my luggage and how big of a bag and this and that. All of that will be next week with Brother Danish. Inshallah, you'll get the email tomorrow. Jazakumullah khair. Let's make a special dua to Allah that our Umrah is accepted, that our Umrah goes with ease and comfort, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not test us and make this suffer a means of expiation and kafara for our sins, that Allah azza wa jal removes from us the faqr and the sins that we have, that we come back from this Umrah as clean and as pure as our, the day that our mothers gave birth to us, that this is just one of many other Umrahs that we continue to do until we meet our Lord, and that Allah Allah Azza wa Jal accepts our Umrah and our Tawaf and our Sa'i and our Salah and our Dhikr and our Duas that we make that Allah Azza wa Jal accepts all of them and gives us better than what we ask for. Ameen thumma ameen. And inshallah we will continue later on inshallah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.